Hello, and welcome to A Drink to the Past, the only podcast in the world where I say something different, stupid about whatever our podcast is that we did this week, because we do a different thing every week and forget to do something that we were supposed to do most weeks. That was almost a sentence. That was the human centipede of sentences. I think that was like three sentences kind of eating each other. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, John Michael Patrick Thompson. Um, I'm wearing my beer shirt. It says cool, funny stuff, but it's hard to hard to sit up that far. <laughs> Beers to answer. Anyway, chest. close enough. Yeah, I, I showed them your my chest. Here, here, that's better, right? My wife told me to. Watch uh, out, you might get demonetized. Yeah, for all the money that I make on my, you know, yeah. 29 subscribers on Podbean. Uh, so if you're on Podbean, then go check us out on YouTube, because you actually just got to see my nipples. Or don't, and subscribe on Podbean instead, if that's not your thing. And if you're shocked and horrified at what you just saw on YouTube, you can also subscribe on Podbean. Or we got a little, yeah. we got a little something for everybody. Right, yeah. If you're into whatever it is that that was. Uh, anyways... Uh, so let's get right into everything. Um, as I said, I'm the host, and this is my co-host. Hi, I'm Chris, a dumb jackass on that. I forgot uh, to put up our logo. Here's our logo. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to close that. Not sure how I ended up forgetting that, but, uh, I did. Chris, a dumb jackass? Is that what you said? Yes. Sorry, yes. I wasn't paying attention because I remembered I didn't have the logo and I had it like in a separate window behind the thing that I'm recording because I have a really dumb redneck way of setting up this recording <laughs> thing. Daddy. Anywho. All right. So uh, today on Sean Drinks Something Stupid, I'm finally going to take my punishment for last year's E3 bets which I was hoping to do again this year, but then there was no E3. But since it's E3 time-ish, um, I figured, okay, as good a time as any. So anybody familiar with World of Warcraft might recognize this. I am not familiar with World of Warcraft. Maybe you should explain okay. it. This is a relatively obscure the... item anyway. Uh, this is uh, the Tankard O Terror, which was an item that you could get in World of Warcraft um as like part of one of the special event halloween dungeons um and it was it was actually a pretty good it was a mace in the game so you could you could like hit people with it and it was actually a really good useful item if you happened to be a one-handed mace user which like nobody was but i made my rogue use that instead of daggers and i had two of these for a while was my weapons i was dual wielding these giant tankards and beating people this is fairly hefty anyway and i'm gonna see how much beer it holds and by beer i mean punishment because today's beer of the week is my punishment i have some pbr oh no yeah that's just terrifying. And what's even more terrifying is I'm not totally sure how much this holds, so I have a lot of PBR. Oh. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Anywho, uh, I'm going to drink a whole bunch of PBR now. Uh, put it in this tankard o' terror. Also, if my brother Josh is watching, I stole your tankard o' terror. Come to my house if you want it back. Uh, I washed it out for you. <laughs> I was uh, digging through our old stuff at um, my parents' house, and this is one of the strange things that I found. Anywho, speaking of uh, weird stuff that I found at my parents' house, let's get into what you're playing. Um, so, I have been playing something interesting. At least I, I played one chapter of it because I found it back at my parents' house when I was cleaning out some stuff for them, uh, which is kind of amazing, and I'm, like, actually slightly stupefied that I have this fairly rare collectible game here, which I found, which is Fire Emblem, Path of Radiance. Um, and I'm super stoked that I was able to replay the first chapter of that because that is my favorite Fire Emblem game, and... It's actually, like, just kind of, like, crazy that I just had a $300 video game just lying around. Uh, it's, to be fair, it's about 120 for extremely roughed-up copies. Mm hmm And 480 for brand-new copies. So, uh, 
Yeah, the only... I, I kind of price-checked it a little while ago, and uh, I price-checked it again when I found this, and the only ones I could find were running in the $300 to $300, $50 range. Um, my copy is pretty good. Like, the case has a little couple of dings on it, but the manual's still there and intact. The disc is, uh, you know, perfect. It still, like, no scratches. It, I put it in my GameCube. It works fine, so I'm like, that works out pretty good. I can't tell how much head is on this. So but, uh, I, I, I've got two PBRs in here. Uh, these are 16 ounce cans. I and do it's want about two thirds of the way full. So let's I do it. want to point out that I was not told that this was E3 Punishment Day. <laughs> uh, well, and because uh, I wasn't if, told, if this one doesn't fit in my tankard o terror, I'll save this one for your punishment. <laughs> okay. Uh, I so today I actually ordered beer online for the first time ever neat i haven't done uh, and seems ordered like only good beer so thing to do doesn't it yeah okay yeah getting a fair amount of head on that it's a weird angular mug to pour into and i'm not sure I, i've never had a pbr before so i'm not sure if, like if they're prone to head when coming out of the can i feel like most people who drink pbr just kind of drink it straight out of the can yeah. So, you know. Anyways, fair amount to hit on this, but I think it'll hold three of these. So, three times 16 ounces is 30, 46, 46 ounces ish. You said 16 ounces? Yeah, 16 ounces. Yeah, that's 48 ounces. 48 ounces. I, I remember how to math. I did part of it. Yeah, I totally didn't just pull up a calculator instead of, you know, doing the math in my head. I was close. For a guy who didn't have a calculator. All right, so yeah, three, three of these comes out with a, just a tiny bit of head on the top there. So, uh, hooray for PBR. Apparently, this is difficult to hold next to a microphone. <laughs> Bottoms up. Apparently, I've got more than my head of PBR. Don't die. It's that just three. It's just three head. PBRs. Hmm. Actually, there's a lot more head than I thought there was. <laughs> I'm like, two gulps in, I drank down about an inch of head. And there's still huh. more head. So, PBR must be heady, or it's difficult to pour in this weird glass, or I'm crappy at pouring. So, some combination of those things is probable. Anywho, um... What else have I been playing? Not this, but I got it in the mail, and I'm excited about it, because according to the GameStop website, it wasn't supposed to ship until, like, three to five days after release day, and it arrived on release day. So instead of that, I've been playing nice. Doom Eternal, um, which is pretty sweet, because uh, I, I did finally finish up Final Fantasy VII Remake, uh, so I got my Platinum Trophy. Took me 105 hours, and I'm a better person for it, probably. Uh, or just a gigantic nerd. I'm not sure which. No, don't really care. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, so I'm super happy that I got, like, there's a couple of collectibles I could go back, and I might eventually come back and do the last, like, eight collectibles I think I didn't get, um, on my achievement runs and stuff, because they're, like, only available from, like, optional bosses in hard mode is some of them, and I was, like, mostly concerned with getting through the chapters on hard mode for the achievement, uh, so I might come back and do that one of these days, but Doom Eternal has been a lot of fun. Um, is it plays a lot like the first, first Doom, the Doom 2016, obviously is what I'm referring to. The first in this kind of Doom series, I don't know exactly, it's like kind of a reboot, kind of a sequel, started with Doom 2016, you know what I'm saying, anywho. Um, so it plays kind of like that, but I feel like everything is more balanced um, to give more purpose to some of the mechanics that were not as well implemented in Doom 2016. Like, there's a thing where if you use your chainsaw on a demon, it'll drop a buttload of ammo, and that was almost never useful because the levels just gave you enough ammo to get through 
and usually, like, too much ammo, so that, like, eventually, like, if you would, like, only use one gun, you'd probably, like, run out of shotgun shells and have to switch to your machine gun or your plasma rifle somewhere, somewhere through there, but you pretty much always had enough ammo to get through whatever challenges, and you didn't need that extra from the chainsaw, so you just kind of used your chainsaw as, like, a back up oh i don't have time because there's lots of demons around me i'm gonna just kill this thing to get it out of the way was basically the only reason you ever used it um but then most of the time you were like too afraid to do that because there was so little ammo for the chainsaw you had to collect gas cans to refill it and so it, it was like a cool idea but it was not as well implemented as it could have been and i feel like doom eternal smoothed that over by giving you, like, significantly lower maximum ammo sets, and also, like, s less ammo drops through the level. So it's, like, kind of interesting, and, and there's more gas cans. So it's, like, this mechanic feels like now it's actually a core part of the gameplay instead of just a thing you can do. So that's pretty sweet. Also, there's a buttload of platforming, which is not what I expected, but it's, like... First-person platforming, how... How, how does that work? Do you remember Metroid Prime? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I don't remember much about the platforming in Metroid Prime except for fuck bomb jumping. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember we doing the double that being my bomb least jumps, favorite. That was like a pain in the ass. I remember uh, the platforming in Metroid Prime being my least favorite part of the game. Yeah, actually, I think this fourth beer will fit in here now that the head has settled. So let's uh, let's find out. Um, Drinking a lot of pee. <laughs> BR. Okay, to be fair, PBR is a step above certain other beers. Mm -hmm. Funny that we're from Colorado and we're like decrying Coors on half our podcasts. Do, 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 do. I mean, Coors may be co from Colorado, but uh, so there are lots and lots of other beers. Yeah, like, like too many beers, maybe. All right. Uh, but yeah, the platforming is actually okay. I th I feel like the second level in Doom Eternal, like, really gave you it maybe too much platforming and not enough demon killing. And some of the demon killing was amidst platforming, which was, like, kind of annoying sometimes. Because I, I had to retry this one part of the level, like, a whole buttload of times. Because, like, you'd jump over a pit, and then you'd have to, like, use your mechanics to get to the other side. And you're, like, swinging on, like, doing... It's, it's actually kind of cool, because there's, like, parts of the environment that you have to jump off of, or you can grab onto, but they'll fall away after a minute. So it's, it is pretty cool, well-designed platforming, but this one level was, like, or part of the level was you're, like, going through several of these relatively complicated things that aren't, like, super hard to do, but it's kind of, like, annoying to do once you've done it, like, four times. And then you get into, like, this gravity lift thing that shoots you up on top of, like, this pillar. Right, and so you're on a fairly small area running around on this pillar, and just these, uh, like, two caca demons come out of nowhere, and there's some other guys up on the next ledge that you have to go to that are all shooting you, and they all knock you off, like, all the time. <laughs> I was like, damn it, I got knocked off so many times. I died more from falling off of that ledge than I did anywhere, like, probably in the rest of the chapter collectively. <laughs> uh, and it's... So it's, it's been pretty fun, though. Okay, so yes, four PBRs will fit in here. So, that's the 64 limit. ounces. This is a whole growler of PBR. Uh, who would want a growler of PBR? Not quite as badass as a tankard old terror of PBR. So, actually, that's not the worst, like, crisp lottery... I don't know, like, American thing that I've had. It's better than that purist that I had a few weeks ago. It's better than Bud Light and better than Coors Light. So, like, huh. it's actually more drinkable than I thought it would be. Lies. Like, malty and simple. Not great, but it's, it's far from the worst beer I've had on the podcast, actually. So What, uh, what rating would you give that? I'm gonna give that a hmm. Let's say I'll go for another. I don't know, 
eight. It's not okay. great, but it's not as bad as I thought it'd be. It's, it's like a, you know, if it was on sale at a bar for like a buck a pint, then sure, let's go for that. Maybe. Yeah, I'd, I'd still probably pay four bucks for a Guinness myself, but, you know. It could, I mean, there's something to be said for quantity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> if, if you're looking to get drunk, this is not the least tasty way to do it. Anywho, uh, Chris, what have you been playing? Uh, so I've been playing uh, just a little bit more of the Command and Conquer Remastered Collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, yeah, it plays... Th this is an authentic recreation. It doesn't seem to have a lot of the problems EA uh, has with a lot of other games. Mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, they they blow it up or they fuck it up with some kind of uh, malware attached to the program or something. This is just straight up Command and Conquer. Right. Original soundtrack. Uh, updated uh, with some updated songs and some updated graphics and that's it. Uh, do you know how much I so, wish they'd do that to this game? Oh, I would love to see them do a re-release on that. It, it's due. It's due for a re-release. Uh, like the, they could uh, do a... The one, like, minor complaint I have is that the 3D animation in this game has not aged very well. Um, In-game, it's, like, fairly okay with its contemporaries. You know, it's a bit pixely in places with the character models. But, like, in the, like, big 3D cutscenes, um, it's, like, very obvious how old it is. I'm like, hey, these guys look really weird, and it's a little cheesy to look at nowadays. But it's like, you know, still, still good. So happy to happy to replay that again. Uh, I've also been playing Dead by Daylight. Mm -hmm. uh, the Silent Hill update just came out, so I now that. I've been. I, I didn't know they were doing so many like crossover things in Dead by Daylight, so that's kind of interesting that they get Silent Hill and they've they've got like several other crossover things, don't they? Uh, yeah, they've got they've got a lot of the ori like original movie killers, like uh, Freddy Krueger and mm -hmm. like uh, Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. Uh, they also got the Demogorgon from Stranger Things. They got a uh. uh they got a killer they call the pig, who mm -hmm. apparently is, like, the apprentice of the killer from Saw. Cool. So, uh... So I've been having a lot of fun with that. Pyramid Ooh. Head is... himself is actually... Uh, he looks like he's a lot of fun to play. I still haven't played him. I played against him quite a bit as a is, survivor. I, w I was wondering if he's as fun to play as he is in Bomberman R. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody... Never played Bomberman R. Didn't you play that when I first got my Switch? I thought... I, I had a few times when people came oh, over yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. played a couple of matches of that. Because that's, like, one of the greatest underrated Switch launch titles that, like, kind of flew under the radar for most people, I feel like. Uh, but, like, it really solidified, to me, like, the multiplayer versatility of the Switch. Because you can literally get eight players on one console in that game just like hand out joy cons and you can have eight player local multiplayer in giant bomberman maps and i'm like that is amazing and like you can say what you will about the gameplay it's the same as bomberman has ever been but if it ain't broke you don't need to fix it and the story mode is okay the story mode is like you know mostly generic bomberman kind of enemies and mechanics uh but then uh it's actually got some pretty interesting bosses so i was like actually that's an okay, you know, I, I think it's like, and, and I think it was only like 40 bucks or something when the Switch launched too, so it's like a relatively cheap game that you can have like basically infinite replayability as a party game with eight player and, uh, local co-op, or not co-op, local multiplayer. I'm like, and Bomberman is just kind of, you could release it on anything and it would still be fun. It's Right. It, whatever the gameplay element of it is of it. It's always fun to sit down and play a few rounds of that. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, and then the last game I've been playing or replaying is I've gone back to Dragon Age Origins. Hmm. 
Uh, and I started a cheat save. Uh-huh. Uh, because I don't really find the warrior or thief gameplay all that fun. Uh-huh. Or interesting. Uh, but it is fun to boost my stats to their absolute maximum and just smack a guy and watch him die instantly. <laughs> nice. And so... I feel like I'm playing, but now I'm playing through that game and I'm starting to think to myself, am I just playing through like a more complicated visual novel now? Hmm. I guess, kind of, huh? If you want to look at it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I played a little bit of Dragon Age Origins back on 360, I think. Yeah. It's, it's pretty... I mean, it's kind of old. I was trying to remember if it's original Xbox or 360, but I'm pretty sure it was 360. It's, it's 360. Uh, yeah. Um, so I I didn't play very much of it, but I had some hilarious stories. Like um, I was the human warrior, I think, and like I went into the like first quest where you're supposed to figure out what to do about this rat problem. And, uh, like, as the human warrior, it gives you, like, you and your dog are, like, your first two party members. And me and my dog just, like, killed the crap out of these rats. And, and we all come back, and it's the, the, the game, like, has this, like, if you hit things with your sword, you get, like, splattered with blood all over. And so me and my dog come out just totally covered in blood. But the NPCs don't react to it at all, and so the like the maid lady or something is like, "Oh, did you take care of the rat problem? I hope you didn't hurt them." And I'm just like soaked, head to toe, just red. And I'm just like, "No, we didn't hurt them, but they won't come back." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, uh, it, it is funny because in some cases they will react to you being covered in blood. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the begin at near the end of like the intro for the city elf section mm -hmm. that I recently played through, uh, one of the guys is like uh, says, "Look at them! They're covered in blood. Uh -huh. uh, maybe we should negotiate." And then I killed his ass anyway. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, I didn't get very far, but like I made myself like a sword and board kind of fighter and I was like ridiculously tanky and then like my dog would just like I just basically sit there and kind of absorb hits and block stuff and my dog would just murder people. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty funny. Um, but I yeah, I didn't get really all that hooked into it. So, yeah, uh, I, I feel like compared to a lot of RPGs, it's more focused on the dialogue and what you could do with the characters as mm -hmm. it is the combat. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I think uh, they Bioware nailed combat and exploration in the original Baldur's Gates. Mm -hmm. Particularly the first Baldur's Gate. Mm -hmm. But then the games after that like Dragon Age Origins it's just there's much less to explore, mm -hmm. so it's a lot. The, those games really aren't about that. Right. Cool. And the last thing I was playing was apparently magic, because I found this random sealed deck, and I have no Ooh. idea what it is. So I'm going to open it live on the podcast, because maybe that's something people want to watch. I don't know. I watched an unboxing video today of the uh, $300 special edition of the battle for bikini bottom that comes with like a statue of patrick and sandy and spongebob uh. i was like this is like so surreal that i have to watch the entire unboxing video so i've got no idea what this is it might actually just be a land pack let's find out it's okay. m13 so the first card is a planes and the second card is a planes i guess they always put third them. card is a planes yeah Ooh, Fourth card's a plains. Too. And swamps. Mountains. Wait, it, wait. it is a land pack. It is totally a land pack. It's, it's nothing but land. Uh, you, you might you might want to save that for uh, for one of the days when the quarantine lifts yeah, and yeah. the uh, I have a big box traffic. where I just keep land in so I'll, I'll 
put it in there. So that that's funny. I was like, maybe it's like an expensive rare deck. I was like not expecting that at all. I was expecting like some random, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, pre-made deck or whatever. But apparently it's just a land pack. So that's kind of funny. Must have come in a, like a fat pack or whatever. Anywho, let's go into the news and booze. Why don't we? So, first interesting piece of news and booze, KFC Philippines has opened a location in Animal Crossing New Horizons. So if you get, like, their friend code or whatever, you can come hang out with Colonel Sanders and get an in-game coupon to use at real-life restaurants for a free eight-piece chicken bucket. But this is only for KFC in the Philippines. What the fuck? That's hilarious. Uh, okay. I'm seeing... KFC Philippines like light up like you're talking but i'm not hearing anything oh hold on let me drop and reconnect Still not hearing the chris okay well he's disconnected and reconnected me okay did that fix that still can't hear chris why can't i hear chris this is odd and so because i can't hear chris i am going to fill in this segment with filler can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Why can't I hear Chris? I'm going to disconnect and then reconnect. That is a picture of the last thing that Chris put in and then a message that I sent him to the chat. So, now we're back. Can you hear me now, Chris? Can you hear me now? I hear you now, so that's awkward. Here I am. Oh, wait, I don't want to share my screen. I want to use video. This is strange. That was, okay, yeah. Pause the video now while we figure out what the fuck is going on. Thank you for bearing with us during these hard technical difficulty times. Uh, we have to drink because of the uh, technical difficulties. Not really sure what happened. I unplugged my headphones and plugged them back in and now I can hear again. So I, I wonder if uh, my video is recording the system audios it might have been able to hear you even though i couldn't uh so i'll, I'll go back that's in the video great. that'll that i feel like that's fairly likely now that i i guess it was just a problem with my headphones somehow anyways uh let's drink speaking of which chris i don't think you told us what you were drinking no i was uh waiting for you to ask i am drinking a breckenridge brewery vanilla porter uh i've had this before and i like it not a bad one uh so. One of the better things distributed by Anheuser Busch, because uh, they bought out Breckenridge Brewery a couple of years ago, but uh, Breck still oh. makes like some pretty decent beers, and I almost don't mind that they were bought out by Bush, because that means that they like do a lot more mass production, but it's still the same recipe, so it's still decent beer. But then you get like stuff like, you know, all the, you know, Budweiser kind of deals like. 15 packs for like you know 15 bucks 16 bucks uh when they're on sale so that's actually kind of okay because they're like they have a 15 can mix pack that's usually like 20 bucks which 20 bucks for 15 cans ain't bad anyways and then sometimes it goes on sale for like 15 i'm like okay <laughs> can't really complain about that i mean that's less than two dollars a beer so yeah um Anyways, uh, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One versions of Resident Evil 8 have been cancelled. Ooh, what? So it's only coming to PC and next-gen consoles. It's coming to PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, or x Sex, as we went over last year. Last podcast, last... Drink! <laughs> Anyways, it's not coming to PS4 or Xbox One. Um, so I, I just thought that was kind of interesting that... Uh, they, you know, initially wanted to do it for the, you know, kind of bridge the gap, but they ended up, uh, it sounds like they just made it, like, too big to feasibly put on all this many systems while they're still making it really good for the other systems uh, without, like, so they sacrificing decided... it on the older systems. So. so they've decided to focus on the next-gen systems yeah. to get more... Which I think More might not be a bad idea anyways, because um, 
I think it'll work out well for PS4 and Xbox, or for PS5 and Xbox Series X, sales-wise, because Resident Evil is, you know, obviously a really big title, and I feel like that's going to be something that people are going to be like, okay, I'm going to buy a new console for that, whether it's PS5 or Xbox. doesn't really matter. Uh, I think that's going to move a fair amount of consoles when it comes out. Um, especially, like, in the first year, there's not a ton coming out for either console that we know of. There's, like, a couple of good games sounds like here and there, but I feel like that's going to be one that's really going to be, like, People are going to be like, okay, there's these two games and Resident Evil. Okay, now I'll get it. Anywho, uh, there was a leak uh, that was later revealed. Uh, Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory. Uh, the logo leaked, and then a few days later, it was announced, and it's apparently a rhythm game what? in the Kingdom Hearts canon. And April's reaction is my reaction here. Yeah, uh, so... Who was clamoring for this? Uh, I don't know. Um, actually, you know, one of the guys on Game Explain is talking about uh, Kingdom Hearts and rhythm games all the time. So there is an audience f for this. Yeah. Uh, do you like rhythm games? Yeah. yeah. But you like Kingdom Hearts? Yes. But and the l ending of the last canon. one sucked freaking balls. Oh, did it? Yeah. Mm. Because, well, you know how much I hated the flying. I I wanted. He's never played the game. And I'm like, just beat the final boss for me. It's all flying, and I hate the flying. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I played like two things, and one of them was the final boss. <laughs> and the ending. Sucks. The other one, I just like kept running around and like summoning Wreck It Ralph to fuck up shit. Just the Wreck It Ralph summon. I mean, that is like the selling point of Kingdom Hearts, is you it's have the, the Wreck It Ralph, Ralph summon. summon. Yeah, that's like the biggest thing for me in Kingdom Hearts 3 is there's Wreck It Ralph! Yeah. <laughs> So anyways, yeah, this, uh, it looks kind of vaguely interesting gameplay-wise, almost kind of like a Guitar Hero-ish, because it's got, like, there's, like, three tracks, and, uh, based on what's in the way on the tracks, uh, I guess you have to push buttons to the music somehow, um, and you, you've got, like, Donald and Goofy and Sora on each of the tracks respectively, and they look like attack stuff to the music or, or something so it, it all looks like uh might be a kind of a neat game um but yeah what the fuck this is kind of sort of out of nowhere um not that there's anything bad with that but uh whatever star wars squadrons uh had a big old release trailer it uh releases october 2nd it didn't actually have any gameplay though uh but it looks pretty neat a lot of space battley stuff so um yeah i'm kind of like thinking back to the old rogue squadron games um looks kind of cool any thoughts on that uh is this the year that ea gets things right for a year and then the next four years is ea sees its own shadow and goes back to greedy corporate practices we'll see Kind of up in the air. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't pay attention. There was also an EA Play, which s sounds like it was more or less a Nintendo Direct, but EA focused. Um, and I didn't hear much out of it. There was like a couple of things that I was like, yeah, okay, maybe that's newsworthy. And then I immediately forgot what they were. So apparently they weren't newsworthy. But uh, the, the big takeaway that a lot of people were kind of talking about was that um i forgot i moved this when i so you accidentally saw behind the scenes so you have to drink um <laughs> anyway um the big takeaway that people were saying was that ea is still not supporting switch worth shit which i think is a giant shot in the foot i'm just like dude put all these star wars games on switch they will sell like fucking hotcakes right especially right now <laughs> yeah like just like, nobody in their right mind that wouldn't buy it for Switch if they had a Switch, probably, you know? I'm like, I would have been, like, probably 20% more likely to buy Fallen Order if it came out for Switch. Uh, and you know, this I would, like, for Switch. This looks like a cool game that I would buy on Switch if it was on Switch. Uh, and for a game like this, Star this is Wars the sort games. of thing where I say to myself, okay, I'll wait and see. Mm-hmm. I'll wait and see. I'll, I'll wait for the reviews to see. I'll, I'll wait for the reviews and for whatever complaints may come out 
about it. Yeah. And I'll see if it's worth picking up. But I'm cautiously optimistic. Mm -hmm. Also, Pokemon Presents happened, which is an inexplicable Pokemon news show, which is interesting that it wasn't called a Pokemon Direct. It was uh, kind of interesting because... Like, it gets you to kind of wonder, because there's been a lot of people, like, speculating, like, ooh, they revealed Mario, you know, Paper Mario outside of a Nintendo Direct, or Nintendo Direct's done, and now they did, more or less, a Pokemon Direct, but it wasn't called a Direct, so, do you think this actually means anything for the state of Nintendo Directs? I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I have to drink, I think. Probably. If not, you can always drink for good measure. So, yeah, you know, there's that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what to make of that exactly. I'm just like, it could mean something, and it could mean nothing. Nintendo is so unpredictable that I have no fucking clue. Right? Like, they could go, like, you know, do a lot of these mini presentations that are direct-like things for, like, a year, and then just randomly do one, and it wouldn't surprise me at all. Because... They're bad shit. <laughs> you never expect what's coming from Nintendo. Never. It doesn't work. Uh, anyways, a uh, good example of why not to expect what's coming from Nintendo is the first Pokemon Presents uh, news piece, which is Pokemon Smile, is available now on Android and iPhone, which is an app that gets your kids to help learn to brush their teeth via Pokemon. So if they press well, then they get the chance to catch a Pokemon. And it was funny. Like, I didn't think anything of this while I was watching, but I was watching with my six-year-old, and the rest of the entire day, he was like, Dad, can we play Pokemon Smile now? I want to play it. I was like, dude, I had no idea this would be, like, that hot for kids. Um, and then he was, like, really sad when he couldn't play it on my phone because uh, it apparently has fairly Legends. widespread bugs on different phone models and the the big bug is that it doesn't work it just it's like supposed to activate the camera to record your face while you brush your teeth so it can tell if you're doing it right and on some models of phone it simply doesn't work so this that's is what it looks odd like. and come back by you, me yeah there. if so you it's see kind of focused Almost. If yeah, so see, it puts a little chibi Pokemon on your head, and you brush your teeth and stuff. And <laughs> if you see there, you can't, um, my son is just slobbering, because they want to make sure they want, they're trying to watch the, <laughs> the Pokemon. <laughs> so they're not, like, you know, pulling it in at all. And they're, wait, yep, yeah, there. So, do you think this is helping the kids learn to brush no, their teeth? No, not, <laughs> not at all. Is it making it less... It's making them excited about they're brushing they're their they're teeth. They're excited so. about brushing their teeth. And they're you, less... You know... Like, Mommy, don't do it. Mommy, no. Mommy, no. Mm -hmm. that, that's probably a net positive. Yes. <laughs> you know, and and it's... But it really sucks, though, because I wish if they did a good job, they would be guaranteed a Pokemon. And if they didn't get a good job, they wouldn't be guaranteed a Pokemon, because then they still get a chance because Aiden's mouth my little one's mouth is so small he it keeps on saying that he's not brushing his teeth well I know I'm brushing my kids teeth just fine <laughs> this app it's great but it, it I don't know if we just need to get Aiden a different toothbrush I might try that but anyways yep it works. You appeared on the podcast twice. You have to reveal that, <sighs> review that mics you were having. Oh my god! What do I give it? Like every time, like a. What's a 10? different mics? Oh, is you've it never had it? this mics before. Oh, what is it? Is it raspberry or it, some it, shit? No, it's strawberry, strawberry. Which you know how I don't like strawberry. Okay, so it's not as high as whatever you uh, usually. So it's a scale of three to seventeen. Oh my god, this is so stupid. Um. My Nine. wife called us stupid. We have to drink. Oh, that... Dude, you guys are going to get drunk just from me calling you stupid. Cause I, I mean, I have four PBRs in this mug. So stupid. I, I might not get drunk. So I have no idea. Stupid. I looked all over the can. It doesn't say an ABV. 
have no idea how weak this shit is. I'm like, will I get drunk off of this? I've drunk about a PBR and a half, I think. Okay, Google. What's the... <laughs> What's the Don't make me laugh when I'm drinking. 4.6%. Okay, so it's... I'm not like Google, April. It's not that... Yeah, it, it technically it's more than Guinness. Really? But, yeah, if Guinness is only 4.2. Oh, interesting. Oh, it smells terrible. <laughs> oh. Want some PBR? No. Not at 3 all. 3 to 17. What's your mics? Oh, I think I said, didn't I say 9? Nine? 9 is like less than, like 10 is average. Okay. Do you like it more than average or less Whatever. than average? You know, I bought, I bought, um, stuff to make screwdrivers. That's unrelated as fuck. Don't make a screwdriver. How drunk are you? Are you sure you're not drunk? How many mics have you had? Half of it spilled on the couch, so no. So you've only had a half, so you're still drunk after a half? Shut up. I'm tired. Go home, you're drunk. Thankfully I'm home. Oh, I'm yeah. gonna go watch my show about gay rights. Bye! Alright. Apparently that was that. And thank you for staying tuned. Now I'm really through. curious what this show is. I don't know, something about gay rights. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, Pokemon Cafe Mix is coming out on Switch and mobile soon. You can pre-install on Switch, and it's free to start, uh, but it looks like it's going to be riddled with all sorts of mobile game microtransactions because it looks very mobile gamey doesn't look like terrible if you're into that sort of puzzle like like it it looks kind of like the candy crush ish uh like you you kind of match the different pokemon that are like next to each other and they blow up and then you use this mechanic to somehow make drinks and attract pokemon to your cafe looks like uh you know pokemon puzzle game not much to be said about it um the big one is that there's a new Pokemon Snap in development. I think I just stunned Chris. Also, he's on mute. I'm sorry, I'm eating chips. Ah. Well, what do you think about Pokemon uh, Snap? After uh, I'm, 22 fucking years or something. I'm curious to see what the updates will look like. I remember really loving the original Pokemon Snap as a kid, but... I haven't played it in a while, and then I watched someone do a speedrun of it, and I was like, hmm, seems a little underwhelming from what I remember. Yeah, the last time I played it, I think you and me 100 percented it in, like, three hours. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we I'm, came I'm over and we now. were gonna play D&D, but nobody else showed up, and so uh, one of these nights we played Pokemon Snap all the way through, and one of these nights we played... Um, Dragon Ball Z Budokai all the way through. And we're like, were these games always this easy? Right, yeah. Didn't seem like they were back in the day, did it? Um, but yeah, so that's kind of exciting. I think the from the trailer, it looks really, really cool. I'm super excited for this. Uh, Pokemon Go Fest is going to be completely digital this year. Um, accessible by anyone. And Victini is coming soon to Pokemon Go, probably as a raid boss. And Mega Evolution is coming soon as a new mechanic. Um, so Mega Evolution obviously joined the Pokemon in Gen 6. X and Y? Yeah. That's Gen 6. Yeah, X and Y. It was, yeah, it was X and Y. Yeah, I was just... You are correct, I was sir. trying to count what gens was what, and I was like, was it Gen 5? But Gen 5 was black and white, and that was still on DS, so no. Anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, it's kind of interesting that they're gonna go completely digital. I think that might actually work out a little better for them than doing, like, a big Pokemon Go Fest in one city, because... Partially, there's a lot of problems that they've had with that in especially their first year where like there was too much phone activity and nobody could actually get into the network in the entire area. And then they like got like sponsorships from T-Mobile and Verizon and stuff to put like uh, hot spots right there at GoFest. But one of the big problems that I've always had with this is that it's like this is a cool thing that I might consider buying a ticket to if I didn't have to go to fucking Chicago, right? 
if they did this in like multiple cities around i was like i don't see what would be wrong with that like you could theoretically do this in multiple cities maybe i i don't know all the logistics but it's also like i'm in denver denver is a huge fucking city make one in denver <laughs> that is very strange yeah so now i'm like kind of more or less over pokemon go so i'm probably not gonna buy a ticket anyways but um i don't know i'll look into what all it comes with and stuff like that and it, it's something i might consider the isle of armor dlc is available for pokemon now galarian farfetched is now available in pokemon go which is actually no longer true it was as of the time of the uh pokemon news thing but it was only out for like two days like 48 hours or something and now it's not there anymore so i caught a couple so that's good for me uh and another pokemon presents news thing is coming june 24th so there's gonna be more pokemon news next week that's huh so our... i wonder if this is gonna be a weekly thing or if it's just yeah i gotta imagine who knows it would be hard to keep up with that much news every week uh i'm like i'm not expecting as much but like maybe they'll give us a update for the second wave of pokemon dlc or um, you know, there's also a couple of other things that are kind of in the pipeline from the Pokemon company that it might be referring to. Like, obviously, we heard about Pokemon Sleep ages ago, and nobody fucking knows a thing about it still. So, like, is that even still a thing? Are they still developing that? Who even knows? I don't even... <laughs> such a weird I guess we concept, on it. but like i've seen that you can apparently like catch pokemon while brushing your teeth so why not sleep right <laughs> and uh that was the last of it for the pokemon thing but then there is another thing um super smash brothers character reveal is coming monday june 22nd and they, Nintendo of America Twitter specifically went out of their way to say that this will not feature any further character announcement. So I feel like that kind of speaks to the fan base of uh, Smash Bros. That they just expect something every time there's even a chance. Even if it's like not really a chance. And then they're upset when it doesn't happen even though there was no indication that it was going to. So, I wonder if that's just generically a player entitlement problem. Maybe. Like, we're entitled to this many characters. Although, people wanted... People wanted lots and lots of, like, their particular character yeah. in Smash I Bros. I kind of get that you want to know, like, what you're paying for, because, like, obviously, you know, you might not be all that into an ARMS character, but if the other five characters are... Uh, you know, characters you really want, then maybe you'll want to go with the $30 bundle instead of the $5.99 each or whatever. But at the same time, you might be really hyped about an ARMS character and spend 30 bucks on the pack and then be like, oh, I don't care about, you know, Doom Guy and Travis Touchdown or whoever ends up being in Smash. I would be so psyched if Doom Guy and Travis Touchdown got in Smash. That would be fucking awesome. But it's probably not going to happen. I feel like... They're, like, both maybes. Travis Touchdown, I think, is at least more likely. Like, yeah, cause he's not that he's part of an outside big game. Nintendo presence, obviously. Uh, you know, first No More Heroes game was obviously um, on Wii. Um, both of the first two. And they were later ported to PS2, I think. Um, and then, obviously, we've got now the next two kind of games uh you know in the series are both on switch so you know he's a big enough nintendo ish rep even if he's technically grasshopper studios close enough and last piece of my news and booze except for something that chris put on here later so i'll do the last piece of video game news and chris can do the other thing uh endeavor rx is a new video game approved by the fda to treat ADHD. So, where was this game when I was a kid diagnosed with ADHD and uh, <laughs> taking taking drugs to compensate? Yeah, I don't know because uh, this is kind of an interesting thing because it's look it's like marketed as a drug free alternative uh, 
ADHD treatment, um, you do require a prescription to do it. Uh, and it's aimed at children age 8 to 12. You navigate along a path to complete various tasks, and it uh, basically has you play this for 30 minutes a day for a month to kind of get your, you know, brain into focus mode somehow. I don't understand all the science, but uh, like it, it sounds pretty interesting. And they uh, went through five clinical trials with over 600 children, and apparently that was enough that the FDA has approved this as ADHD treatment, which is the first time the FDA has approved a video game for treatment of anything. Which is, I'm, so that's just a kind of a neat, weird, historic thing. That is historic. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking I missed out on uh, my, my particular ADHD treatment, but I'm curious to see how effective it is when done publicly, when we have yeah. a bigger pool of uh, yeah, kids the that they're charging this on. Then. I think, because I'm just generally of the mind that, like, if there's a non-drug answer, then that's usually the you know, the route that I want to go. Not that, you know, there's anything wrong with other people having their opinions and whatever. But generally, if I can go without, you know, altering my brain chemistry on the molecular level, that's what I want to do. So I think this is a, you know, a great thing. And I think there's a lot of other areas that potentially video games could probably look into in, you know, medical science. I, you know. there There is a little bit of irony that I want to point out that we're on a podcast called drink to the past we're telling and we're warning against altering your brain chemistry on a molecular level chemistry on a molecular level what i will say is that though if you can do a drug free treatment for adhd that is the way to go those no. there are negative repercussions that can happen later in life from being on a drug like uh, say ritalin yeah um, and obviously we don't know exactly what the extent of side effects of this will be too. So it's, you know, I'm not saying that this is a perfect alternative or anything, but I think it's interesting that, you know, research is being done in this direction. So do you want to talk about Kevin Crawford? Yeah. So Kevin Crawford of Sign No Mind fame, uh, says that he might be aiming for a fall Kickstarter for Worlds Without Number, which is a GM toolkit and D and D ish retro clone, hmm. and what I didn't post here was uh, his folder that he's been posting full of a uh, full of uh, betas hmm. that he's been iterating on, and I'm liking the shape of this uh, of this system. It looks like a very it's like almost ideally simple D D ish system that he's setting up with a bunch of world building tools inside it it's got only i think three classes plus one class called adventurer which lets you mix and match uh -huh. but it kind of covers all of the archetypes and then it has a lot of weight it has a lot of um potential it feels like neat uh I plugged his stuff, and Chris brings a thing on this podcast before. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I'm ex based on what I've read out of it so far, I'm expecting great things. Yeah, looks kind of interesting. Just from the, you know, I'm like going through just like a few pages, and it's like I've I already feel like I've, you know, looked through half the book. It's like I've gone through classes and ability scores and skill checks and backgrounds. I'm like. I've only gone through like four pages, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I guess it must be fairly simplistic. Um, but does it sound like it works pretty well, as well as un you know another more complicated system? Uh, yeah. So the framework of the system, I can is based on. It looks like it's based on his Stars Without Number system, uh -huh. which has been kind of the go-to D and D ish like sci-fi tabletop game that you could pick up for a long time now. Mm -hmm. All right. So um that's pretty neat. All right. And okay. uh I guess that'll do it for our news and booze. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, shall we get into our video game topic? Yes. <laughs> 
3D versus 2D platformers. Just a kind of a random topic that I thought about for some reason because um, I was uh, actually doing this platforming in Doom Eternal and I was like, huh, that seems really out of place in the first. Like, I feel like it's better integrated in later levels, but the like the second level of Doom, Doom Eternal is like really, really, really full of it and there's way too much all at once. But then it like it calms down and it's like, okay, there's some platforming here and there and it's okay and I'm good with it. <laughs> but like I was like, uh, you know, and it was it was fairly well designed 3D first person platforming stuff, like I said earlier, but it, it just felt a little out of place uh, at the time. And it got me kind of thinking, like, I just don't like most 3D platformers. Like, there's uh very few that I would say are like even like games that I like. I think the only 3D platformers that come to mind as being genuinely good or great are probably some of the later 3D Super Mario titles. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, Mario Odyssey uh, is one that really comes to mind as a great 3D platformer. That's a game that I really, really liked. And Super one of my favorite Mario games. Like, probably second favorite just... But I like Super Mario World is my favorite, and I feel like probably eighty percent of that is nostalgia goggles. Um, so, but I, I kind of agree with you. I think three D platformers, the vast majority of three D platformers, just aren't very good, uh, and I think they require a hell of a lot of more polish mm -hmm. to get right. Yeah. than, say, a 2D platformer does, and a lot of that has to do with just the difficulties inherent in 3D, like camera control. Yeah. That was one of the big things about uh, Super Mario 64, uh, which is kind of funny, because, like, a lot of people really, really love that game. I really just didn't care for it that much. Like, I remember playing it at the time as a little-ish kid, is what it would uh, I would have been like seven or eight probably when I played that, and I remember liking it as a kid. And but all I remember is like, yay, it's Mario. You, you know, I don't remember shit about actually playing it. And then when I revisited it like a long time later, it was just like clunky as fuck, and like I couldn't get the camera to do shit. And I was just like, why is this not Ocarina of Time? I, and I kind of feel the same way about Super Mario 64 in that it's it's kind of it's a little clunky to control. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like they didn't quite get it right until Super Mario Sunshine. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, around that time, I was like getting into that age where I was like, Ooh, I'm too old for Mario. I'm in middle school, bitches. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I basically played nothing between Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Odyssey. So I have a large gap of not playing Mario games, uh, especially the 3D ones, because I, I did play some of the 2D ones. I had like some of the Super Mario Advance games where they remade the SNES and NES ones on Game Boy Advance, and I played all the new Super Mario Brothers, like on, not all of them, I didn't play the 3DS one, I played the Wii one and the Wii U one, and those were both okay, um, but I feel like they're kind of examples of like, not that great platformers for the 2D side, so, so this is kind of a, I'm not just saying that it's objectively 2D is better than 3D, but in general, I prefer 2D platformers, and I'm not sure if that's because I prefer 2D platforming, or because I just happen to have more games that I like that are 2D. Because, you know, the, the new Super Mario Brothers games were fine, but, like, not very memorable. Like, I remember all the chaos of playing four-player co-op, and Luigi would jump on my fucking head, and i yell at you know, you or whoever else we were playing with at the time and just be like, damn it, quit jumping on my head, you know, and it, 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 a lot of funny shit happened from that, but that was what I remember, I don't remember a single level, I don't remember a single, like, 
I, I remember one. It was a very generic from, Mario yeah, game. It was really generic, and other than the four-player co-op, it had nothing going for it as a 2D platformer. And then you get games like Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, where it's like every level is like the platforms are like integrated into the level. The music is amazing. The environments are just vibrant and full of life. And it's like, are you sure these were designed by the same company? I mean, they and I, maybe Retro Studios did Tropical Freeze, so they yeah, were think, technically same parent company. But you know what I mean. Developers. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think 2D in general is easier to handle than 3D. Mm. It's easier to develop for, and when you boost anything to 3D, uh you have to deal with that much more complexity uh -huh. in terms of games that play 3D, not in terms of, like, not not just, like, graphics, because there's definitely games that play like a 2D game, even though everything's 3D modeled. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. like, but... Freeze. I think it's not really as apparent with a lot of games, uh -huh. or with a lot of genres, because... Mm. Uh, lots of genres are 2D or 3D exclusive. Right. And a game like... Uh, and platformers are one of the few things that kind of coexist. Mm -hmm. Where you can definitely... They're like a 2D platformer and a 3D platformer are like comparable genres. Right. Yeah. And we're only now kind of getting that with a few other genres, I think, like Metroidvania 2D, and then you have Dark Souls, which is 3D. Right, yeah. Because you had a little bit of that in, like, Metroid Prime, but Metroid Prime was almost more of a platformer than it was a Metroidvania. Uh, you know, because it had fairly extensive platforming segments in there. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, it, it wasn't... It didn't feel like... Th this is one of the things where I feel like other M was the better Metroid successor to uh, me than Metroid Prime, which again I was crucified on another podcast because of this opinion. But uh, it it feels more like a 3D Metroidvania where there's all sorts of different corridors. You can go any different way you want. You know, you know, you don't always know where to go. Where in Metroid Prime, most of the time you did, and there was still some backtracking where you'd have to go all the way back through an area to go out an uh, you know an alternate exit or something to that area. But it 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 didn't feel as open ended and in, as maze-like, because uh, there, there was a lot of open areas within it, which worked well to its advantage. I think that was a good design choice, but it didn't really feel like a Metroid game. It felt like a space shooter where you were also doing some detective work to figure out what the fuck happened with the Chozo and shit. Which... That was also kind of neat. Just scanning, like, every random thing to, you know, learn random bits of lore. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Uh, I think 3D games are just harder to do well in general, mm. on average. And platformers are one of the first genres that tried to make the jump from 2D to 3D. Uh-huh. And a lot of our mental examples of awkward platformers came out of those initial attempts, like Sonic yeah. Adventure, or really any 3D Sonic. Yeah, that's something uh, that I was going to bring up, actually, is one of the 3D platformers that I do like is Sonic Adventure, uh, but not necessarily because it's great, but, you know, I, th I thought it was kind of fun at the time. It was doing different things than, like... Mario, um, and I, I thought it worked okay for what it was, uh, which obviously, you know, I'm not a huge, huge Sonic guy. I've played a decent number of Sonic games, but I'm not like, oh my god, Sonic. But, um, you know, you can say that it didn't necessarily bring the series into 3D and do it justice, but I thought it was a fun little game, except for Big the Cat. Fuck him. I think Sonic Adventure was kind of a promising like first try uh -huh. and then the sonic 
uh, series kind of failed to live up to that, to mm -hmm. the promise of improvement yeah. from that point forward. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, as an early 3D game, I thought it did okay, because, you know, the big thing with those was camera control or camera movement if you didn't have control. And I don't specifically remember controlling the camera, and I don't... I can't think of how you... Like, you probably had, like, a recenter button or something, but that was about it, which I feel like in the early games, that's what worked best, like, if you didn't have full control. Because, like, Mario 64 tried to give you all the control, and it was like, yeah, the camera's over here. And I was over here. And I was over here. And if you're listening to the audio version, that probably made no sense. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. He was leaning back and forth in his chair. Here, here's the... Uh... Here's the, clo the captioning audio. for the blind. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, but, and then you have a great use of camera control in Ocarina of Time, where the camera was, like, mostly just kind of following you, and if you did want to recenter it or turn around and, you know, center it on where you're facing now, you could push one button and it would recenter. And so I feel like that was kind of the way to go until twin stick controls happened. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of what I think about at least camera controls for early kind of 3D games. But, um, so what are some 2D platformers that you really like and what kind of sets them apart as great platformers? Um, and, and what are maybe, are there any 2D platformers that you really just don't like? Uh, that kind of are on this opposite end of the spectrum where we're like, yeah, the 3D ones just don't do the genre justice. Because I'm trying to think of, like, a 2D platformer I really don't like, and I'm like, it's not... I think not the 2D platformers we don't like, or we wouldn't like had we ever played them, are the kinds that get covered by people like the angry video game nerd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh... Where, it, where it's just the lack of care put into the game. Uh, things like imprecise controls, uh, which can sc screw up a game. Oh. Uh, things like it's un unclear where the platforms are. Uh, mm -hmm. Think occasionally like stupid design decisions, like falling damage in a two D platformer a non-realistic 2D platformer. Yeah. Uh, and I think all of those can be pointed at as examples of lack of care or lack of polish. And they're just the sorts of things that would get aggravated by a move to 3D. But, well, I guess that you know, kind of makes in sense. 2D. Yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of a specific game that I don't like as a 2D platformer, and... Really, the only things that are coming to mind are, like, I really, really suck at Mega Man. But I'm like, is this... That's kind of adjacent to a platformer, but I feel like Mega Man is almost its own genre. Right? It's it's not exactly a platformer. It's kind of like a... Action okay, game, I'm... but with platforming elements. I kind of have a hot-ish take. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was not a fan uh, in, in the, like the very early Castlevania games. Uh -huh. I was not a fan of the platforming, hmm. and that had not everything to do with jump. If you jumped in the air and you got hit by an enemy, you would get uh, knocked back and fall in a bottomless pit and die. Mm. That sounds. And I. Poop. Yeah. Yeah. I and I like the games the other than Castlevania that. Castlevania games. I've played a handful of them, but I don't remember anything specifically like that. But that's another thing. Like, Metroid and Castlevania are, like, again, like, platform adjacent, but not really platformers, per se. You know, they've got and platforming, but I wouldn't call them platformers. Yeah. If that makes sense. The, the, I'm like, I didn't like the platforming in that game, even if I liked the game overall. Yeah. And it's like, I've always kind of liked Mega Man and had a respect for it, but I've also never beat a single Robot Master. Wow. Not even one. I suck that much at Mega Man. 
I'm terrible at Mega Man, and I don't really know why. Like, I, I thought I'd maybe, like, try and give it a real go when Mega Man 11 was coming out for Switch, and I, like, downloaded the demo, and I was just, like, dying over and over and over and over, and I was like, I yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I think for us, it's a lot of the genuinely terrible platformers mm -hmm. came out before our time. They came out for, like, the NES and maybe the early Super Nintendo. Right. Uh, and past a certain point, a lot of the... It, it was no longer the genre to make. Hmm. It was no longer the thing uh, to make if you were, like, doing a licensed game. So a lot of those genuinely terrible games just kind of passed us by, so we're hmm. blissfully ignorant of them. Yeah. All right, well, is that all for our uh, video game topic or any kind of closing statements? Do you, uh, Which one do you do, do you specifically prefer, 2D or 3D platformers? Oh, I, I definitely prefer 2D platformers. Yeah, that's kind of what I was not having to deal with, Not having to deal with a camera is a blessing. Yeah. Um, in general, I prefer 2D platformers, and 3D is, like, it can be fun, but... Like, I very rarely have a great experience with a 3D platform. Like, I'm, I'm even trying to think back, like, when I was... Banjo-Kazooie? Yeah, like, Banjo-Kazooie is a good game example that... that, like, people liked. And I remember, like, playing a little bit... Of, I never had Banjo-Kazooie or Donkey Kong 64. Uh, you know, th those kind of generation was, like, the golden generation is what I'm told of 3D platformers. But, like, I played a little bit of Banjo-Kazooie and more of Banjo-Tooie. Um, and I I just never really had a very much affinity for them. Like, they were okay, but I just didn't care all that much. Uh, you're not gonna... It, it, it's, it's bad that we feel the same way about this, because we don't have... I guess we don't have much to discuss about it. Yeah, I, I guess... I would... We, we, we need, like, a real uh, Banjo-Kazooie fan. Yeah. Or... Super Mario 64 fan to get on here to fight us over this. Right, yeah. Maybe we'll bring that back up one of these days. So if you're listening and you're interested in coming on a podcast and defending Banjo-Kazooie and Mario 64, then let us know. And instead of that, let's move on to our table topic. All right, so um, we're going to talk about our favorite tabletop RPG expansion books because among other stupid things I found... Um, if my brother Josh and watching, also I stole some of your old books. Um, so uh, I got here two of my favorite expansions that I, I never actually owned, but I stole them from my brother when he wasn't looking because he left them at our parents' house. Um, so I got uh, Seafarer's Handbook, which is a 3.0 version guide, I believe, and uh, Arms and Equipment Guide, which was made for 3.0 and 3.5. I'm not sure which version this is. Probably three zero. Um, I and I'll, I'll I'll say right now not that this is the topic. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough time for me to cover everything. Right, I'll yeah. I'll have to pick and choose. Yeah, yeah. So I was figuring, you know, just some of our big ones that are our favorites. Uh, you know, because we've been around the block enough times. I'm sure we could both fill up, you know, a pretty good list. Like we could probably have a whole hour and a half podcast about nothing but that if we really wanted to. Um, not that I even have a ton, but I've been around specifically Dungeons and Dragons enough that I feel like I could make up a pretty good list of random other books. Uh, that have been published, especially in the 3.0 and 3.5 era. There was a buttload of, like, third-party source books and uh, additional uh, wizard supplements, just tons and tons of extra content for D&D that I've had some amount of exposure to sometime over the years. And um, So, yeah, these ones are kind of cool. Um, so Seafarer's Handbook is uh, all about... Um, seafaring obviously so it's got uh, quite a number of different uh like ship to ship combat rules it's got like underwater exploration and you know some design tips for you know doing underwater campaigns as well as got like a fairly lengthy list of extra feats and spells and stuff that are all kind of nautical themed so uh there's a lot of kind of cool 
just random stuff in here. Um, it includes a couple of playable races, merfolk and aquatic elves and stuff like that. Um, just really awesome little book. Uh, I thought was really kind of fun. And there was another, I'm trying to think of what it was called, but there was another uh, like seafaring kind of book that we had back in the day um, that also had like a whole bunch of really, really broken um, feats and equipment. Seven things. Cs? Yeah, Seven Cs. Or Seventh C? Yeah, something like that. Um, and uh, it, it had all sorts of stuff that we used to abuse all the time that made melee fighters like comparable to mages in D&D. &D. And that's one of the reasons that these were my favorites is uh, Seafarer's Handbook and uh, the other one was um, 7C, I think. Uh, but, like, putting both of them together, you could uh, make a melee character that could actually, like, do shit against a wizard, you know, or, like, comparable damage sometimes, or, you know. And a lot of it was, like, really, really overpowered, broken stuff compared to anything any other melee fighter had. But at the same time, it, like, it put them on the same level as wizards, because... Like, in D&D, &D, wizards and sorcerers are just better than melee casters all the time. Clerics are better than melee all the time. Yeah. That's how it works. And so the fact that it kind of busted melee characters in order to give them that advantage was, like, pretty cool. Because there was a feat called Bruiser, I think, in the 7th C. Maybe it's in this one. I don't remember. But um, there's a feat called Bruiser that's, like, you take a minus two on your attack roll... And you get to double your strength modifier to damage with your weapon. So it's that, it's like power attack, but 8 billion times better. So for the people who are not versed in D&D uh, &D 3.5, which, given the day we live in... I mean, that, that you, might be you like could say this about the same thing in, in 5th edition, and I feel like they would still probably get the idea, you know. If yeah. you have a plus 5 strength bonus or something, you know, this is objectively better than power attack. Uh, and you're you're gonna and you're gonna have more than a plus five. Yeah, especially if you're playing three. Yeah, when you're playing three point five, especially at high levels, you get like absurd fucking shit. Especially when you get the magic items, because the magic makes everything better. So, it, you gotta you gotta love the uh, min maxi options books. Yeah, that's another reason why I like arms and equipment guide, because there is so much junk in here. That is just like, you know, why would you ever want that? But it's neat. Why not? And so, like, um, if, uh, I don't know if my brother wants this back. If you want this back, come over and get it. It's my house. But um, if he doesn't, then I'm literally just going to start using this as treasure. I'm going to flip to a page, and I'm going to point right there, and I'm going to say, you got a dwarven stone heavy armor. Okay. You know, all sorts of weird it's shit. Like a thing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, there's so much stuff in here. There's, like, additional kinds of armor, additional modifiers for weapons, uh, you know, so you, like, that dwarven stone obviously would be on some kind of heavy armor, so I'd probably, like, okay, roll it up. It's half plate or whatever. But, um, and tons of different, you know, stuff in there, um, I remember looking through there tons of times when we were min-maxing our characters back in the day. Um, so it's a great little nostalgic find that I was ended up coming across. So it was pretty cool. Um, what kind of books do you like? Do you, uh, do you have any specific of those min-maxing ones that you were talking about? Or uh, any other ones you want to mention? In terms of the min-maxing books... Uh... I, I don't know. There, there's no particular one that I want to bring up. <laughs> and that... Because they actually are not my favorite type of expansion books. Mm -hmm. I feel like they both, in terms of broadening options available to players, mm -hmm. uh, they also t tended to create kind of a culture around only allowing the official officially sourced things mm. as opposed to you know brewing your own shit which i yeah. th think is 
like the platonic ideal of tabletop RPGs. Mm-hmm. What I would say instead would be books like the Tome of Adventure Design, which is just a huge ass book of random tables. I I I brought this on the uh, podcast before, mm-hmm. uh, which just has pretty much everything you could want to roll up in terms of monsters, villains, dungeons, uh, just in a condensed package. Uh-huh. And I like I like those more because they give you kind of a wealth of options. Hmm. Yeah. Um other than that I also kinda like some of the um like expansion books that came out for three oh and three five that were like just random supplements of just like, hey, here's like three extra classes. You know, stuff like that. Like, Tome and Blood um, was kind of cool. It came with, like, Bloodcaster and some kind of other thing. Or Sword and Fist that had, like, the... Uh, Drunken Master. Drunken Master was one of them. There was a lot of different versions of Drunken Master in different 3035 handbooks. But uh, I think I think that one was one of the coolest. Um, and... Because a lot of them, like, you had to, like, specifically pay attention to how much you had actually drunk and be like, okay, I've written down how many drinks I've had consumed, right? Uh, Where this one was, like, the only thing... I think it had, like, one mechanic like that, but most of it was just, like, you get Drunken Master-themed abilities and they just work, and it's just assumed that you're probably drunk all the time. So I was like, "That, that works much better than, like, literally, you know... Because that's one kind of min-maxing that I don't like. Is It's not really min-maxing, more micromanaging. Uh, when you're in there, when you're like, okay, I have a drink now, and uh, so I'm ready for combat if we need to. And then, you know, uh, you know, I, I have these drinks, and then, you know, uh, combat starts, and then, oh, I haven't had enough drinks. I have to spend a bunch of time drinking to actually use my abilities. And then, and then some of them are like, you use up the drinks in your body in order to use them, and then you have to drink more halfway through combat. It's like, it's just bogging down shit. Just get on with it. It's bookkeeping. Yeah. And bookkeeping is basically never fun. Right, yeah. That's, like, why I never track my player's ammo. <laughs> like... Uh, I did think of a 3.5 book that... A 3.5 specific book I really liked. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was Manual of the Plains. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting that at about 11 or 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh... And just having all the descriptions of all the various afterlives and heavens and hells hmm. and places you could visit as a high level adventure. Neat. Uh, which was really cool. And also, I think it had like the planner hierophant or something like that, which was a really broken prestige class. Nice. I'm trying to remember what it was actually called. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, what do you think about one-shot adventure books? They're kind of supplemental things. They're related to this. Uh, for that, um, it's a lot more variable. It, it depends on the how good the adventure is. And I, I have a shitload of adventure books sitting on my shelves that I keep on glancing over at. Mm-hmm. And they're of... Some of, they're, some of them are of uh, different qualities, but I, lo- I uh, like... A lot of them. A lot of them are come up have like a unique idea, or they do something interesting, and you can just pull them out and run them as like mm-hmm. part of a campaign, mm-hmm. or just for players. Like a what was it murder marvelous Mur- murder mansion, right? Which I was running you guys through with the vest of armlessness. Oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had a couple of them. Uh, I don't use them, like, all as much. I don't go through the whole thing. I pretty much just, like, look through the adventure and pick and choose, like, some of the scenes I like. Or, like, ooh, I like this dungeon idea. I'll kind of use the idea of the dungeon and maybe, you know, copy the map or something. 
<laughs> you know, so I, I am really like, I just kind of dissect these and take the parts I like and throw them into my campaign somewhere. I think that's kind of what they're there for. That's uh, you, you can run them as written or you can just take the parts you like out of them and brew it into your own mm-hmm. thing. That, that's what they're good for. Yep. All right. Any final thoughts on this topic here? We can't. I was like, we don't have enough time. We, we, we need like four or five podcasts to cover every, yeah, maybe we'll, every maybe we'll thing we Maybe we'll this again on here and, uh, you know, do another. Yeah. Just reuse the topic again. And just talk about other ones that we didn't get to get to. Something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for coming on Drink to the Past. I'm your host, Sean Michael Patrick Thompson, and I've still got some beer, so that means you have to drink. Or I have to drink. Or Chris, drink. Are you drinking? I'm drinking. Okay. I'm drinking. You better be drinking. Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna come over here and throttle you with this shit. <laughs> this tanker of terror not, is not. like probably a scary thing to get hit with. I don't want to catch coronavirus from you. This is a level eighty epic mace or legendary. That was what the epic. Legendary. Legendary oh, oh, was like oh. the great thing, and epic was like the things that you like had to go through. Like ridiculous amounts of side quests and weird bullshit in order to do, and like barely anybody ever got epic items because you had to do so much crap to to just get them. I and this comes from playing Hearthstone, but epic was lower than legendary. It was like epic was purple and legendary was orange. I thought legendary was purple and epic was orange. So maybe I do have that backwards then. <laughs> You, yeah, you you might. This uh, was a purple. Th- this item. is so you don't want to get okay. throttled with this. It's it's a purple item. I'll, I'll just hit you with my sword. One of my swords. Sorry. Right. Which one? Well, probably the arming sword. Because hmm. you know. I do have it, arms. Yeah, I can disarm if, you if with you, the arming. If you cut it off, is it a disarming sword? I'm really, you know, what I'm really missing is I'm missing uh, swords in the short sword category. Mm-hmm. Are we officially onto random bullshit now? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're onto random bullshit. Unless you want to plug our shit, I guess we forgot to plug our shit. Eh, I, I don't care this time around. Okay, so <laughs> pretend we plugged our shit. Uh, oh, viewers, go go listen to another the ending of another podcast about like the last five or ten minutes, and you should get uh, one of our plugs. I'm Sean Michael uh, Patrick Thompson. I do stuff on Two Guys Playing Zelda. That's Chris. He does stuff on Drive Through RPG. Look him up. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm really. I'm drinking. I'm really missing swords in the short sword category. I don't. No. I, I, I got an arming sword, which is a nice one handed sword, but kind of awkward to swing indoors. I My think he'd like. The okay sword that I have is a short sword. I've got, because, like, all of my swords are showpieces anyways, but the one I have that might, like, that that probably wouldn't break in combat if I actually tried to use it is uh, this little short sword I have that looks like a fucking lightning bolt. It's like, uh, you know, 440 or something, but it's decently thick and sturdy, so it's, like, not bad. Like, most of them are a lot thinner than that, and most of them have plastic handles. So this one at least has a metal handle. <laughs> has a has a metal handle in it. Yeah. And it has and some the nice. Looks uh, like a fucking lightning bolt. You've seen it. Yes, I, I have seen it. I'm, I'm thinking to if my Xbox. Do, I don't know if it's short enough to keep structural integrity, being stainless steel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now now we're gonna get into sword nerd topics. 440 is a form of stainless that's good for like knives. Uh huh. Uh, and and not stainless an Xbox. Yeah, <laughs> St- and stainless steel knives are fine. Yeah. But apparently, past a certain point of length, uh, stainless gets really brittle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you hit something with it, there's just a good chance of it shattering. Yeah. So that would definitely be an issue if I was actually to take it. But it's like. Thick but yeah, that's that I, I would probably trust it more than my other swords because, like, I've got two master sword swords, and one of them's got a pretty good blade, but the plastic handle is 
super like it's it's cool looking and from a distance you wouldn't be able to tell it's plastic necessarily but it's totally plastic and if like i'm pretty sure if i hit anything with that at full force the handle is going to shatter <laughs> it's going to be yeah. the issue with that sword and you you know you don't want your handle shattering if you uh swing a sword no that doesn't help uh and and I'm betting because it, you know it's some Chinese company making a master sword replica. It's probably not full tang. Uh, you know, I would be surprised if there's a half tang in there. Yeah, it's it's probably yeah it, yeah it's a showpiece. It's it's not meant for yeah actual it's, that's use. That's pretty much the kind of things I've all bought. You know, I I haven't bought a yeah. lot a lot of swords, but I've bought a handful, and all of them have been showpieces because. You know, I like neat looking swords and, you know, I bought them partially because I was like thinking of maybe doing some Link cosplay at some point or something. And I never ended up doing that. But, you know, I can still like wear it with my kilt and stuff. And people are like, hey, look, a master sword. That's kind of neat. You know, whatever. Yeah. But, yeah. You, know. you could always get a basket hilt claymore. I have thought of that. You know, if I got a battle ready something, then a basket hilt might be a good way to go and then get a you know a good big targe and you know really do it up because i've i've got a dirk that's probably pretty good for combat that i could just stick with my targe um that'd be cool i always kind of wanted to make a homebrew D D class based off of that idea where you've got the basket hilt claymore in one hand and the dirk and the targe in the other hand um and make it all about because basically the combat tactic that they would use, the targe is a large round shield basically and they would hold that shield on their arm and they'd also have a dirk which is about a uh, 12 to 20 inch knife um and they'd kind of block with the with the shield and then they could get into you with the end of the dirk that was coming past the end of the shield uh, so they'd get blocks and, uh, and a stab in there and then they you know have their big cleaving hits with the uh uh, with the claymore, obviously, or there, there was also some amount of tactics uh, that they could, you know, like kind of block with the the end of the shield and get it caught between the shield and the dirk to, you know, move, you know, kind of move your Take sword around out of yeah. the way and yeah, then yeah, get, get a hit out of the way the and basket not hit. Yeah, and I and so I thought about making a homebrew D and D class like that that was all about like getting extra attacks of opportunity if they blocked or stuff like that. Um, and I thought that would be a kind of a neat sort of a thing to design. That, yeah, that and, would actually be pretty where they pretty could cool. retain their armor class with the shield and the second weapon, so they could dual wield but still retain the armor class from the extra shield. Uh, as just as their class feature, so I thought that would be kind of cool. Because that's one of and, the things that you can't really do in... Because I thought about, like, making this kind of character concept as a fighter, and there's not really any way you can do that. Because it's like, you use your offhand weapon, even if you have a buckler, which is the only shield you can use with an offhand weapon, then you remove your one AC, which, you know, at that point is almost negligible anyways. So it's like... You know, what if you could have, like, a large shield or a kite shield or something, you know, get... Uh, two or three AC out of it, uh, you know, maybe at high levels just for cheese, do like, even you can use this with a tower shield and retain your AC while you're stabbing people, you know. I would like to as, see... As, a, as like a high level ability, I don't think that'd be that busted, right? Just getting I, I... like an extra D4 of damage of stabbing people and retaining I... your four AC, that wouldn't be bad. <laughs> I would like to see uh, more classes or like more fighting styles inspired by real life tactics even though it's not a good idea to do that for like everything or try to accurately model them right because otherwise you get dragged down into bookkeeping like like there's fighting systems and rpgs that have tried to model realistic combat and they are all uh really clunky and slow and multi-step because they model things like pain and... I'm talking about the Riddle of Steel. R Riddle of Steel is a realistic fighting... It is about as realistic as you can get in a fighting system in an RPG, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, kind of painful to get through a round of that. Yeah, I feel like thematically, 
you have or you have to go and look at things thematically rather than realistically in order to make a compelling RPG system. Because like, yeah. if everybody you know like died from one gunshot, like is realistic, then any gun based RPG system would be boring as fuck. And there are, I'm like, Shadowrun's a system where everybody is squishy. Like, you take, or like, World of Darkness. Mm-hmm. Like, where it's like, oh, a yeah, gun but deals. You're not, like, totally screwed. You know, at, at some of the, it, like, in, in World of Darkness, I have a little bit of experience with. And, like, at low levels, yeah, if you get shot, you're probably going to die. Um, but, like, it's not, it, it still is, like, far enough into that fantasy that it it, it kind of works out anyways and it you're not always totally screwed by you know just getting shot one time but sometimes you are especially at low level and there there is something to be said about like high mortality combat yeah. systems but i think most people are not looking for a realistic combat system, they're looking for a fun combat system. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, somebody, I think somebody on Twitter I saw was putting a, put up a meme that said, um, your job as the DM is to let the players win, but not let them believe that you let them win. Uh, something along those lines. And I, I was like, conditionally, that's, that's kind of true, you know, because, like, your goal as the DM is to make an adventure that they can get through, but, you know, to some extent, you know, the danger has to be present, you know. Uh, that's why I always have kind of thought of myself as an okay DM, because usually I get people, at least somebody ends up close to death in my sis- in, 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 in a session, right? And pe- and people can die in your people system. have died, yeah. I've, I've been a DM for yeah. people that died, you know. And my thoughts are... To whoever said that on Twitter, I don't know who said that. I think that's yeah, I don't that's wrong. I think your your goal as the DM is not to let the players win and make them think they won, because the players are going to notice that they fucking win all the time. Yeah. Your goal is to make is to put together like an interesting thing that they can interact mm. with and affect in in a way that they find interesting. Yeah. Uh, but not guarantee. Right. Any outcomes, which means that having consequences that are parts of their actions that might lead to death mm. is a necessary outcome. Yeah, I feel like we had something about this. I feel like we should just add like high mortality combat to a list of future future topics here. Yeah. So uh, high mortality mortality. I can spell come. And. In- the funny thing about D and D is that it has both high mortality combat and low mortality combat. It has high mortality combat at low levels, and low mortality combat at high levels because you just have that much, that many more def- defenses. Yeah, because like at high Except levels, for, you know, you're like, like oh, I've already got you know all of these crazy things that buff my saves. I never fail a save unless I roll one. Yeah. I, I attack you and you die because mechanics. Uh, so I think most other RPG systems tend to be either low mortality or high mortality and not both. And it's mm-hmm. funny that D&D starts as one and ends up as the other. Yeah. You know what else is weird? What? We were in the random bullshit and then we accidentally like had a, like a second table topic halfway that yeah this is like visit later but a uh, legitimate topic <laughs> yeah we were supposed legitimate. to do random bullshit and we forgot so because we screwed up we have to drink oh god you still got any beer uh i have run out hmm. I'll finally drink for you thank you and uh because i have not run out yet got i speed. also don't have a buzz yet after three and a half ish pbrs it is 4.6. Yeah, it's not very much, and I'm a reasonably fat Irish guy. I'm pretty sure I've had glasses of water with a higher APV. <laughs> Could be. 
What are you spiking your water with? I want some. I don't know, fluorine? Hmm. Oh yeah, just just for just for the conspiracy nuts, there is fluoride in your drinking water. You should drink it because it makes your teeth better. <laughs>